Hello, Dr. Malvika Kashran, and thank you for accepting my invitation for this interview. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Ranier. I'm very, very happy to be here. I am Malvika. I am a senior researcher at the Alan Turing Institute, and I'm working on projects around open research, community building, and reproducibility. And hopefully, we'll talk about some of them during the conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So how do you, you mentioned reproducible research, how do you define it, it and why it's important for you? So reproducible research, you can define in various ways, but the simplest definition that I have learned is when you have a set of data set, you have a set of code or processes, someone should be able to apply them and get the same result as you get. So throughout the process of our research, starting from designing our work, collecting ideas, collaborating with people, you know, applying research practices, publishing it. There's a lot of work that we do. And if we do not communicate what we do at every step of our research, people who would like to reproduce it will not be able to reproduce it clearly. So I work a lot in the computational part of research, uh, meaning that the reproducibility should be quite straightforward where someone has written a piece of code that should analyze a set of data and they should produce the same result. Uh, however, in coding or in software, you have different versions of package, a version of environment, a version of uh, various different things. And if we don't define those versions, we might be applying the same steps, but we might not be getting the same result because some parameters have changed or, or the way we're looking at the visualization makes us believe on some other answers than the answer we saw initially. So yeah, simple definition, same code, same process should give same result no matter who does it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not that simple in practice. Yeah, I, I have my own experience with that. Uh, of having the code and trying to get different results. It's interesting that now for managed to write the paper about my first, my first experience with this, but that's for not the time. So what are the barriers today to do reproducible research? Yeah, it's very interesting what you were just talking about is that you know, trying to reproduce someone else's work and getting very, very frustrated. And I think these are the experiences early career researchers go through quite a lot because they're trying to learn from previously published work. They're reading them, they find that exciting. They have the data and the code people published and they're trying to work it out. And it doesn't work because obviously some major steps in the paper have not been clearly defined. Um, so I would say the barrier for a lot of people actually trying to reproduce work is not having access to all the information. The second barrier could be that they might have all the information, but the actual paper or actual research has used technology or software that is not available to everybody. Um, and they haven't considered that when they were developing this pipeline. So it's possible that you're working on you know, high uh, HPC or a cluster that is really located in your own organization and someone else cannot access it. But when we are publishing those kind of results, I think it's very important to consider if I want someone else to reproduce it, what else can I give them? You know, maybe thinking about virtual environment, or thinking about a container or thinking about anything else that makes it easy for someone else to test it. And there are so many technologies out there right now, for example, We've learned about Jupyter Notebook where you can publish a piece of code and you can host that on binders so someone can click it without having to install a lot of stuff. And maybe that's one of the easiest thing which may not work for highly complicated software. But yeah, I think the barrier is people either not communicating everything, people not providing access to the information that's needed. Final yeah. barrier I would say is as a researcher, when people are working on different topics, they consider reproducibility as like, I'll apply that at the end of the process, right? Like they don't really consider that reproducibility is about applying it every step of the way and considering that as an integral part of the research process. So a lot of people I've talked to and I would ask them, hey, have you 
captured the practices from your work in a documentation. And they would say, well, documentation takes a lot of time. I don't have time for that. I'll finish my research and then come back to it. And when they finish their research, they've either completely forgotten what had happened. Yeah, and they would have someone else, something else to do. Um, and it never ends up happening. And I think I understand that documentation takes time. It's time consu consuming. It's not as fun as writing code, but it is so, so important for reproducibility from my perspective. I think there's so many like great real world example that we can learn from where reproducibility has gone wrong as in nobody could reproduce result, but the paper was so prestigious or the result they talked about was so, so prestigious that they they had devastating effect on people. Like so much we know already from COVID that people are publishing result as fast as possible because it's important. So we can you know move on as a civilization together. But then in all these processes, there are some papers that get published that wrongly claim effect of drugs on cure, curing COVID. And that's not true. Uh, people haven't peer reviewed their paper, but the, you know, it's, it's the world that we live in right now that we want to trust some results. We have no ways to reproduce them. We don't have time to reproduce them. And just imagine the devastating effect that may have on society as a whole. And you build more research on top of those papers that not yeah. people didn't yeah. properly reproduce. Yeah. Absolutely. And see what it's leading to. But let's try to talk about more happy things. <laughs> you, you have been working on the Turing Way for more than two years. Uh, do you, can you tell us how the Turing Way is solving some of the barriers that you previously mentioned, like the version, different versions or re research is not fully dedicating time to documenting things? Yeah. So the Turing Way is a community-led guide to data science. Uh, we involve and support community members who are researchers, uh, professionals working in industry or policy or often government as well in understanding what is their responsibility of reproducibility, where they should take ownership of the work and where they should make sure that reproducibility is integrated in the research process. Um, and the Turing Way tries to build chapters or re bring resources together so people can find out about these complex topics in, in as simple manner as possible, and then find resources that they can learn about after the Turing Way. So the Turing Way doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. We know there are a lot of information out there. We want to make information findable. So we categorize all our chapters into the guide for reproducible research, where we talk about version control, reproducible environment, uh, continuous integration, containers, code reviews, code quality, testing. So all those technical parts of reproducibility. But then that's not enough, right? Like technology is just a part of research. There is so much that we as human play in the process of research about collaboration. How can we collaborate effectively? How can we use documentation to be as clear and as transparent as possible? Working in this remote world, how can we make that an inclusive workforce? Talking about communication, how can we publish different part of the research, different research object? How can we make them citable? How can we get DOI for everything? So digital object identifier. And then uh, there's a guide for project design. So often people think about project design at the end of their research because you know they were like, oh, this is what we could have changed. But we want to flip that. We want people to take some time ahead of their research to think about what would they like their research to look like what practices they want other people within their team to use. How would they set up their online repository? Where will they you know, store code and store communication and publish their data and all that? Um, and then finally, we have research ethics. So all the research ethics actually is part of everything that I mentioned, but then there are other aspects of research ethics that people want to learn about um, in, in terms of clinical data. How can we you know, secure people's identity while we're working on clinical data? How can we work um, as advocates for people? How can we, uh, so there is one chapter on self-reflection. How can we as researchers train ourselves to self-reflect on ethical implication of all our work in society? 
And then there are parts where our uh, contributors have written about activism, unions, uh, talking about case studies where artificial intelligence have gone wrong that have had bad impact on people. So how can we learn from those and not repeat that? So all these things that I'm talking about obviously isn't my own work. It's been, it's written by uh, many, many people and we have right now more than 300 contributors. And we have 10 people who are um, part of the core team. They are engaging with us on a very regular basis. So some of the barriers we're trying to solve is to make information findable, uh, relevant for people when they need it, and also create a space where people have chance to get their opinions and get their voices heard. Uh, mostly because we want this project to be global, meaning that we cannot just write something sitting in the UK and think that applies to Latin America or China or India. We want researchers from those parts to come and tell us what is best practices for them uh, and what we can learn from the case studies from their environment. Looks very interesting and so on. Uh, so online, there's a book dash coming on. We want to pitch to our audience. Yeah. So Book Dash are collaborative events where people come together synchronously. So all the time we work asynchronously because we're in different time zones, but we organize this one week long sprint-like event where people can secure two hours or two and a half hours of their day, come and work with us, come back next day. And on the last day, we do a community share out where we share what we've been working on, release the chapters and release the new version of the book. Uh, it has been really rewarding working with so many people in different book dashes. So the next one that's coming up is from 16 to 20 May. Application are open. Uh, I would add the link somewhere. Don't yeah, I would add the link, but the easiest link to remember is bit.ly forward slash Turing way. Oh, have a nice link. Okay, so you talk about uh, lots of ways that people are going to find information that they need, like how to make sure that they're using or informing users of the right version and so on. In a world where everyone is able to conduct reproducible research, what are some of the best practices research researchers should, should consider? Yeah, so this is my place to pitch open research, open science. Um, I uh, would like people to understand how to work openly. And mostly because as researchers, we are working in service of society. A lot of our work is actually funded by public money. So we have moral obligation that the research that we are building or the outcome that we are producing should be available to public and other researchers. So open research is that uh, field of practice where we apply open research practices in different part, parts of our research. For example, if you're publishing code, you can apply open source practices. If you're publishing data, you can apply open data practices. Uh, same applies to training and networking and platform and so many different things. So open research is quite big. And I would invite you to learn about something that is relevant for you right now. Um, so reproducibility does not mean that everything needs to be open, but if you have been doing all your work in a reproducible manner, if there is one step you can take next, that should be try to open all your work uh, to the extent that it's ethical. Very cool. Uh, so our time is running out. Any other project that you want to share with us in addition to the Turing Way and the book? Dash? Yeah, yes, yes. So Open Life Science. Uh, Ranieri is one of our mentors in the program. Um, so it's a training and mentoring program where anyone who is new to open science or who's been working open science for a long time can bring their project and stay with us for 16 weeks and learn about different new practices in a systematic manner and apply them throughout the process. We are in the fifth round of our cohort, meaning that there have been five groups of people who have uh, graduated from the program. There are more than 100 projects that have come out of the program. We, have, we, are, we are again, more than 300 people currently uh, part of this community. And I'm really proud of this work and you know, just wanna shout out to Yo Yehudi Bernice, but to Amy Sang who are working with me on that project. Um, 
also like going back to the Turing way, as I was saying, that was that's a community driven project. It's it's uh, it's led by Kirsty Whitaker uh, that I should really have mentioned in the beginning. Um, but there's a huge overlap in our communities in the Turing way and open life science. So yeah, um, it's also open. It, Some, it's sounds like a really amazing everybody. project. Well done for everyone. So I want to thank you very much, Dr. Sharan, for your time and your our joyful conversation. I hope that you enjoy your day and big success on all your projects. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Rani. It has been a pleasure talking to you.